So neutrality is a very, very good security guarantee. So you don't need a NATO membership in order to be protected. So that's not necessary. necessary. On the opposite, you're entrapped in uh, possible foreign, foreign wars. Hello, this is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And last night I had a discussion with an Austrian colleague, Professor Dr. Heinz Gärtner, who's a prolific commentator on current affairs in Europe. He's a lecturer in the Department of Political Science at the University of Vienna and Danube University. He was the academic director of the Austrian Institute for International Affairs, and he was an Austrian Marshall Plan Foundation fellow at the Johns Hopkins University. Among other things, he chairs the Strategy and Security Advisory Board of the Austrian Armed Forces and the Advisory Board of the International Institute for Peace in Vienna. Heinz Gärtner published widely on an international security, on nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament, on US foreign policy, geopolitics, Iran, and on the Middle East. I spoke with Professor Gärtner about Ukraine and the future of neutrality in Europe. Please enjoy. Dr. Gärtner, thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, thank you, Pascal, for inviting me to this talk. Uh, Dr. Gärtner, you've been um, one of the prolific Austrian observers and commentators of the war in Ukraine, and it was you who once, uh, even way before the war started, said that Ukraine would either be permanently neutral or permanently divided, ever, that was your position ever after, I, I believe, 2014. Um, can I ask you first and foremost, what's your analysis about the situation in Ukraine today? Uh, how do you think that neutrality could still uh, help to solve the conflict? And do you still think that your original analysis is valid today? Um, yes, um, uh, I wrote a piece in uh, 2014, uh, already before, uh, even before the Crimea has been occupied uh, by Russia. Uh, that uh, Ukraine should look at the Austrian uh, model uh, of neutrality. Uh, of course, then uh, Russia uh, uh, occupied Crimea and then supported the militias in uh, eastern Ukraine. Uh, and then there was this danger uh, that Ukraine remains uh, divided uh, with the Russian, uh, eastern Russian uh, influence. Uh, of course, there have been already some Russian troops as well, even so Russia denies it. Uh, and uh, on the uh, uh, other hand, uh, uh, Ukraine had the ambition uh, to, join, uh, to change, join NATO. Of course, Ukraine changed the position several times, uh, but in uh, 2014, uh, NATO membership was uh, included in Ukraine uh, constitution, uh, but also after the Bucharest summit in 2000. Uh, eight, uh, NATO promised uh, Georgia and uh, Ukraine uh, to become uh, NATO members. Uh, they did not uh, make a, a fixed uh, timetable for that, so no membership action plan, but the eventual goal should be NATO mem membership. Uh, of course, and um, Russia has always said uh, NATO membership of Ukraine would be a red line. It was uh, President Putin already mentioned that in the Munich Security Summit in 2007, uh, didn't happen. What did uh, Russia do? It intervened in uh, Georgia. Uh, but uh, also when uh, uh, President uh, Putin uh, uh, warned in, 2000, uh, in the late 2000, uh, December 2021, uh, with two letters to uh, the West, to, to, to the US, um, and NATO membership would be a red line, and uh, NATO should even withdraw to the borders of uh, uh, 97, which was uh, unrealistic. However, NATO membership was always a, 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 a red line for, for Russia. Of course, there was no reaction uh, by the West, and uh, they told, the argument was uh, Ukraine has the uh, free will to join any alliance, but then the war happened. 
So my argument is uh, this neutrality, uh, this credible neutrality of Ukraine, probably, we cannot be sure uh, the war could have been uh, prevented. Of course, if Putin had other uh, ambitions, uh, intentions to create a uh, new imperial Russia, this argument would not be valid anymore. However, it was, it was not uh, tried. So with this, looking at the Austrian example after 55, Austria was occupied before, uh, by the four um, victory powers. And because Austria declared itself uh, neutral, all the occupying forces uh, uh, would leave. So Austria would get its territorial integrity and sovereignty back through neutrality. Uh, and as I said, that would be a model for Ukraine. Ukraine saying, uh, we are not going to be NATO member, uh, but in, in return, of course, Russia had to stop the, to support the militias uh, in the East. Uh, I have to say, uh, neither the West nor Russia nor Ukraine were really uh, open for this argument. Russia was afraid, Russia only said no NATO membership, but didn't say neutrality because it has had to stop this, its influence in Eastern Ukraine, but also it could have been a model for Georgia and Moldova where Russian troops are deployed as well. And then Georgia would have said that if you withdraw uh, the Russian so-called peacekeepers, uh, then uh, from uh, uh, Abkhazia and uh, South Ossetia, uh, then we can be, uh, become neutral. And the same is Moldova with Transistor and Russian troops are there, peacekeepers are there. So that would have been a model which Russia didn't really want at that time. So it was a model that was not accepted by any, any of the actors, but the only rational model, I would say. So the alternative, the alternative, as you said, uh, Pascal, the alternative uh, was that the Russians would, or that the Russian militias would remain in Donbass for a very long time. Also troops in Georgia would stay and uh, Transnistria for a very, very, in Transnistria for a very long time. So that would be the German model. No, that would be the German model after uh, 45. Uh, there have been several suggestions for neutral uh, Germany, not only by Stalin in 52, uh, but also after Austria became neutral, uh, several Western pundits, diplomats, politicians like George Cannon, uh, then uh, Nolan uh, Humphrey, the two senators from the US, the leader of the British Labour Party, uh, uh, Hugh uh, Geitzkel, they all suggested uh, let's have a central European neutral zone, including Germany, according to the model uh, of Austria, and it should include, of course, the then at that time also uh, East uh, European states like Poland, uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, Hungary, and Austria. Chancellor Adenauer of Germany was a fierce opon opponent, so he wanted NATO membership, he wanted Western integration, he rejected uh, neutrality as a Russian uh, uh, put to sleep tactic as a Russian poison, which was just absurd because uh, neither Finland nor Austria became part of the uh, Russia Pact Treaty, even there was a danger for Finland. Uh, neutrality saved Finland not to become a member of the Russia Pact uh, Treaty. So it's the opposite what Adenauer was arguing. So it was Germany uh, permanently divided permanently means uh, until uh, 89, uh, of course. Uh, but uh, Ukraine had the choice between permanent neutrality, uh, according to the Austrian model, and permanent uh, division, like the German model. This is still on the table. This is still on the table with, with, under much worse conditions than before the war, much worse, because now you have to be uh, the, the military situation, the situation of the battlefield has to be included. Uh, Russia is occupying much more uh, uh, territory, uh, was already declared uh, uh, Luhansk and Donetsk as independent states. And so 
Now for Ukraine, the situation is, is, is much, much, much worse. Uh, but still neutrality could be a model and uh, there would be, of course, uh, to have to uh, connect it to some troop with, uh, withdrawal of, Rus of uh, Russian uh, forces. How much that this has to be uh, now uh, negotiated, uh, but uh, uh, Ukraine uh, should renounce uh, uh, NATO uh, membership. Only then it is possible that Russian troops, uh, Russia would negotiate uh, the withdrawal of, of, of troops. If uh, NATO membership remains on the table, Russian troops will, will remain. And, not, and then we have not only the German model now, we have the Korean model. Uh, after the uh, three year wars, uh, 50, 1950 uh, to uh, 53, uh, permanent division on the basis of war. You only have a ceasefire uh, on the 38th uh, parallel uh, and uh, permanently divided. That's not a good solution for Ukraine. That's not a good solution for Ukraine. So uh, I still think uh, Ukraine would have been better off with neutrality. It's still an option. Of course, now we have we discussed, we can discuss this in more detail later. Uh, uh, it has to li be linked to some sort of security guarantees, but I have to, I have to say, uh, neutral neutrality itself is a very good security guarantee. It's a very good security guarantee. Uh, so, um, the, it, but it has to be credible. Neutrality has to be uh, credible. So, saying Ukraine was neutral and uh, because of that, uh, Russia invaded is, is absurd. Uh, Ukraine said it wanted to become a, a NATO member, as I explained before, and a, a neutral state has to be neutral in peace times, which is very important always to explain and demonstrate, I will, I'm neutral, I will remain neutral. I will not join a military alliance. I will not allow uh, foreign troops to de be deployed in my territory. I will not participate in uh, foreign uh, wars. And uh, a neutral state has to demonstrate it very credibly. So, and Ukraine said they want to become NATO member. That's not the credible neutrality. <laughs> After all, it, uh, it, it was in the constitution to join NATO later on. So I looked at the history and I didn't see much of a violation of uh, neutral, credible neutral states in history. Of course, we, we have the argument, no, no NATO members has been attacked uh, since 45, 49. Uh, uh, of course, but no neutral states has, has been attacked either. So, and we can, can go back in history. Neutral states, the neutrality of neutral states has only been violated in the context of a large war like the two world wars. So that's, but also non neutral states have been attacked. So that's not an argument. Uh, there's always this argument about Belgium. Belgium's neutrality was uh, violated in, in, in those world wars. That's true, but that was in the context of uh, the two world wars. And in the opposite, neutrality, uh, Belgium is a very good example for, for a credible neutrality connected to multilateral security guarantees. So, First of all, neutrality came to an existence as a neutral state. So in 1839, there was no neutrality, no, no Belgium, because the uh, members of the Vienna Congress, the parties, they recognized the Belgian state as a neutral state. And then neutrality kept uh, Belgium could keep its territorial integrity, sovereignty, its neutrality for 75 years. And when Germany violated in 2014, actually uh, Great Britain kept its commitment uh, to uh, Belgium neutrality. And it was the reason given to intervene to enter the First World War. So 
there was a, a security guarantee by the members of the uh, of the Vienna uh, uh, concert, but Belgium had to be credible neutral as well. So it was a good, it's a good example. I mentioned other examples like like uh, Austria. We can go back to Finland a little bit later. Uh, about Switzerland, you know it better. Also, Switzerland benefited uh, from the Vienna Congress got a guaranteed neutrality as, as, as well. So neutrality is a very, very good security guarantee. So you don't need a NATO membership in order to be protected. So that's not necessary. necessary. On the opposite, you're entrapped in uh, possible foreign, uh, foreign wars. So I stop here for the moment and give you the opportunity to uh, ask other questions. Yeah, I think the... the the observation that a neutrality needs to be credible is quite important. We do have this moment when, for example, um, Laos, which was officially neutralized back in the Vietnam War, was then dragged into the Vietnam War, but that was also because the belligerents didn't believe that the Laotians and later on the Cambodians could defend uh, their their neutralities, and then they uh, they were dragged into war. But that's again in the in the context of a general a war, war happening around. Um, the the other there thing is a, I, I want to just to mention that the complete is, Iran was neutral before the First World War and it tried again before the Second World War. But during the war, the Soviet Union and Great Britain would occupy and divide. Iran into zones of influence. So, it, of course, neutrality cannot, in many, in many cases, cannot be kept if a larger war looms. So, but uh, if there's the context uh, to be to be a permanent neutral state uh, and uh, provide credible information about this, so neutrality is a good good guarantee. Sorry for I that. Mean, neutrali Sorry for ne ne neutrality has a track record of working when it's in, in the interest of all parties to, ma to make it work, like for Austria in 1955 and works until today quite beautifully. Uh, so the, uh, the question to me is why are we seeing at the moment the kind of the end of neutrality in Europe? Why are we seeing so many uh, Finland and Sweden like joining uh, joining NATO, uh, NATO and Ukraine being invaded by, by Russia and Ukra the, uh, the rest of Ukraine, the Ukrainian control part still saying that it, uh, that it wants to join a military alliance. And um, why is this happening? Why now that this erosion of neutrality in Europe seems to be happening? Uh, we live in a polarized uh, world and uh, polarity in history has always affected neutrality in one or the other way. Uh, we had this bipolarity in, during the East-West conflict and uh, it was about blocks, the Cold War was about blocks. And the neutral states were the exemption of the blocks. So neutral states were managed to stay outside of the great power conflict at that time. And neutrality saved Austria's territorial integrity, but it also saved Finland uh, from becoming in, uh, integrated in the Warsaw Pact Treaty. So, but other states choose to become uh, choose to become NATO members or were forced to become uh, members of the Russia uh, Russia Pact. So neutrals in many ways were uh, better off at that uh, time. Uh, then uh, at the end of the uh, Cold War, we had this that this was a hard time for neutral states. Uh, we had the situation of unipolar. Polarity, this uh, American political scientist Charles Krauthammer called it the unipolar moment. Uh, it was already the end of the Clinton administration, but also the uh, Bush administration, uh, striving for American, American hegemony. So, unipolarity 
American hegemony never has been fully implemented, but there were there is intentions to do so. And unipolarity is not good for neutral states. There is no room for neutral states if you have a unipolar world. So it, interestingly, it was the time when American ambassadors uh, frequently come to the Austrian government, uh, press, uh, press, pressing the Austrians uh, uh, to question its neutrality. The main argument always was, uh, why don't you send more troops to Afghanistan? So there is neutrality in Afghanistan. You should uh, send more troops and uh, give up your neutrality. So that was the time of unipolarity, this intention. And uh, of course, neutrality stayed because unipolarity did not come into effect uh, uh, globally, what the intention maybe was. Uh, so that was not a, a real good time. And then we moved on, some call it multipolarity, which is a euphemism. I don't think we, we are in a multipolar world. There was a tripolar great power competition uh, going on. I'm coming back to your question soon, I'm just building up the argument. Uh, and uh, between the US, China, uh, and Russia. And polarity is always linked to alliance building. So we had these two alliances during the Cold War. And now we have this uh, polarity already of was starting in the period of unipolarity, but now uh, we have the old NATO revived in the West. We have the building up of alliances uh, in Asia, the AUKUS, Australia, United Kingdom, uh, US. We have the new Quad, which uh, includes uh, uh, UK, US, uh, India, uh, Japan. South Korea is considering to become a member of it. We have in the Middle East the Abraham Accords, which is against the regional Iranian hegemony and alliance. We have, uh, Russia is not very good in alliance building. Russia has the CSTO, the Collective Security Treaty, which is not very strong. Uh, but Russia has allies, but not alliance, uh, alliances. So it has allies in Latin America, in the Middle East. Uh, it, actually, bilaterally, Russia is not bad in doing so, uh, but it, it is not really successful. Uh, and Russia does not have a good attractive ideology. You have always them to have an ideology as well. So the, the West Americans are trying with this ideology, democracies versus autocracies, which uh, is a good deal, hypo uh, hypocrisy. Uh, but it is an ide ideology. It, it's, a, it's attractive for many. Um, communism during the Cold War was to some extent attractive. There was this intellectual debate about Marxism and so it was to some extent attractive. Russia doesn't have a good ideology now. It has anti-Nazism, so that's uh, referring to the great uh, uh, fatherland uh, war. Uh, it has this Russification argument or this uh, argument of the old Russia, uh, of Peter the Great. So that's all ideology. It's not really attractive. Let me just finish uh, with China. China, apart from the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is dominated by China, but it's not a, an alliance, but it is, has a, some security dimension as well. But China has this Belt and Road Initiative, which China says is multilateral, others would say it's bilateral, but it's voluntarily. So it's attractive to many because of trade, because of economy. Of course, China is also building up uh, dependencies, that's true. And now we have, that's an explanation for the Ukraine war. Now we have NATO coming closer to the Russian border. I explained that it's a red line for Russia. China is coming closer with the Belt and Road Initiative, including uh, already uh, East European states, which is 
the patent holder initiative has some power, uh, soft power uh, attraction. So Russia was about to lose the great power conflict between uh, this, uh, US and China. So Putin decided to, to, to get it back by, by a war, which was a very stupid decision because now, so, now the opposite is happening. NATO is coming closer. Uh, China will be strengthened, Russia will be weakened. So it is, was, it is very, very counterproductive. And I guess Russia has lost uh, the, uh, the great power conflict. Now to your question. If you have a situation of polarization, small states have two choices, two choices of polarization, alliance building, ideology building. Smaller states have two choices, either they join an alliance, the bandwagon with a big state. So that's what Finland and Sweden decided to do now. So it's not so much balancing against Russia, what they pretend it's bandwagon with, with the US and uh, NATO. Or they have the choice to stay neutral. So that's the other choice. Neutrals want to be avoided, to be entrapped in great power conflict, which it's, it's argued NATO has Article 5 security guarantees, but it also has the entrapment effect. If there is a conflict, great power conflict, small states are entrapped and involved uh, as well. So neutrality has the effect to say, no, we can decide to stay out of this great power conflict. What happened already, that's why I was mentioning during the Cold War, when state, the neutral states wanted to stay out from this great power conflict. That's why we have now this divide, either neutrality or giving up neutrality. So that's this polarization in the debate. This global polarization is mirroring in the uh, national debates uh, in the neutral states, in uh, Europe, within the states, and also in Europe as such. That's why is my explanation what you ask, why do we have this debate now about neutrality? So it's affected by the global context. Yeah, and on the other hand, the, the part of the world that actually is trying not to be involved in the great power conflict going on is systematically being ignored as, um, as a neutral part of the world. It's, we are usually not perceiving China, India, South America, Southeast Asia, as um, as neutrals, when in fact that's more or less exactly the kind of position they are taking in this in this uh, in this great power competition, uh, the Indian Foreign Minister on the third of this month, third uh, of June, uh, gave a very interesting interview in which it was very hard for him to make the um, the the inter the interviewer the the, the journalist understand that not taking a side, neither sanctioning Russia nor condoning its attack is not being aloof and staying outside, but just having a genuine Indian position, uh, which is in the best Indian interest. So in a sense, maybe we're seeing a uh, like neutrality moving out of Europe and moving to other parts of the world that still do want to make use of what you just said of not being entrapped in one of two camps, but want to maintain a true independent position in a conflict. Would you share that observation? Or yeah, yes, um, still. Uh, the states are non-aligned states, which I can you can argue that's a sort of uh, neutrality staying out of great power conflict. Of course, neutrality as we know it, especially in Switzerland and uh, Austria, is a much stronger uh, neutrality based on international law, based on constitution, and not uh, allowing foreign troops to be deployed on, 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 on its soul as well. Uh, Non-alignment, uh, of course, is much weaker, and it's possible that you have bilateral agreements with great powers. You even can have military agreements with uh, the states. What many of the states you mentioned in Africa have uh, military uh, security agreements with Russia, for example. That's why they want to don't want to be uh, uh, stay out. Uh, that 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 they don't want to be. 
participate in the sanction and uh, abstain in the UN Security, uh, the General Assembly uh, Security uh, vote. Uh, but still, the, what you're saying is they're recognizing there is a great power conflict. And it's an important uh, observation that uh, non-aligned states, and I guess they will be stronger, as you say, in the future. They are aware uh, that the big powers want to involve them on their side. Uh, of course, there is also, but there's also the possibility that they are come under pressure by individual great powers uh, on a bilateral uh, basis, because non-alignment means that you're not part of the block, but uh, still uh, bilateral military, as I said, military, uh, even security guarantees would be, uh, uh, would be uh, possible. We also have the example uh, in Europe with Malta, for example, it's a bilateral, Malta is neutral, but it is a bilateral treaty with uh, Italy and the Italian troops uh, in, uh, in 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 Malta. So there are all kinds of uh, of uh, uh, types of uh, uh, neutrality. Uh, so the the danger with this is that non-aligned states can easily give up their positions if they want to. So what we see now with Finland and Sweden, they were not neutral and non-aligned, and say, oh, okay, now we're joining an alliance. Uh, so we have others, which is in, also in Europe, like Serbia, for example, which is uh, neutral, but self-declared neutral, more or less uh, uh, non-aligned, like the Swedish or the Finnish position, which was not based on history as well. Uh, but I share your argument that when it comes to great power conflict, we have a strong alliance building, as I mentioned, world globally. But at the same time, uh, uh, the wish to stay out of alliances is getting stronger as well. We, we could observe this during the Cold War. So the non-aligned movement uh, was created in the 60s uh, in order to stay out of this great power conflict. And uh, th this was this, I guess it was Nero in, uh, who coined his argument, uh, if great powers fight, uh, cars will be destroyed. So, and they want to stay out. And that's India, it's a strong non-aligned uh, country. So we, we should have made the distinction and I do think neutrality and non-alignment on the one hand, of course, they're more uh, come on under pressure to join an alliance or join a great power, bandwagon with great power. Uh, on the other hand, they don't want to get involved. And all the examples you mentioned, they do not support the war in, in Ukraine. They don't support Russia's invasion because they all want to stress uh, their own territorial integrity and sovereignty. So they don't really want that another country invades another country. So they're criticizing Russia. But on the other hand, they, uh, they are well aware that uh, this war is also used for other purposes and not only to criticize the war. So that's, uh, uh, that's, that's why they take this position you mentioned. May I may, um, end the interview with a question on where do you see neutrality move in Europe? Do you think that this is like we will see less and less neutral states in in Europe, or are do you think that there will be a revival again? Do you think that maybe even Ukraine will, in the end, really be solved through neutrality or not? Um, there is often this argument made because now we have fewer numbers of neutral states, neutrality will disappear. So, because now, of course, Finland and Spain are, are losing their uh, neutrality. But the quality of neutrality is not linked to numbers. So neutrality has its own uh, quality and their functions and roles, uh, what only neutrality uh, can, uh, can meet. Um, so we have, for example, 
example, also I, I would even argue neutral states which remain in Europe are getting stronger or the, the neutrality is getting stronger because now it's not, uh, there are fewer states who can fulfill this role. For example, Austria took a very strong initiative uh, to, uh, to create to, uh, the debate about this treaty on the prohibition of uh, nuclear uh, weapons. So it's now a treaty. Of course, nuclear weapon states do, do not join. NATO states do not join. However, that is, was only possible uh, the initiative coming from a neutral state. No NATO state, no nuclear weapon state uh, would have done so. So that's, uh, so neutrality is a necessity, a, a necessary condition, uh, maybe not a sufficient condition uh, for many things. So for example, Switzerland, Sweden, Finland didn't really support this treaty. Also, we have these negotiations on uh, the Iran nuclear deal, the GCPOA in Vienna. There was an agreement to do it in a neutral state. Uh, there was no other possibility to do it. I'm not denying that other states can have initiatives as well. So they do, Norway they do. That's, I'm not denying. But in some special cases, neutrality is the better place to do uh, things. And neutrality doesn't, I have to make this clear. Neutrality is not an staying out neutrality, what the old idea of integral uh, neutrality uh, in the past. So in Switzerland, we had this debate between differential and integral neutrality, and uh, especially including economy and participating in sanctions or not. Uh, neutrality changes over time, and uh, that has to be recognized. So because Austria now is moving even further from an differential neutrality to an engaged neutrality, that's the debate in Austria. Oh, that's the end of neutrality. That's it, because Austria is participating in the European security and the defense policy, is participating in a NATO partnership for peace, and even is sending peacekeeping forces under UN authorization uh, to combat zones. No, 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 it's not possible. And no, it's a different type of neutrality. It's not the neutrality of isolation, what it uh, is con con considered. So this type of engaged neutrality will be become much, much stronger uh, now because the European Union will recognize that neutral states are very useful. For example, also commanders of neutral states, especially Ireland, uh, Austria, but also Switzerland as well, uh, were uh, used in peace operations in uh, Africa, for example, because commanders of neutral states are more credible than commanders of an alliance. So it was a demonstration, these forces are neutral, they are UN, if may you, they are not French, for example. So if you have French commander, ah, oh, the French imperialism is coming back, French colonialism is coming back. It doesn't always work, but it is an important instrument that uh, neutral states can, can offer. Two things for neutral states, uh, that, that, that they don't, that they should not, they're not allowed to be a danger for anybody. So neutral states should not arm in a way that, is, that they are a danger for anybody or intend to join an alliance where they are considered from the other state as an enemy alliance, for example. Now Sweden and Finland are considered by Russia as enemies, before not, no, because they are mine. That's the first condition. The second condition, neutral states have to be useful. They have to be useful, Switzerland knows this, uh, it's not doing enough like Austria, but they have provide good offices. Uh, they have to uh, provide diplomatic initiatives, economic initiatives, political uh, initiatives. All the time they have offer some something to uh, the host, being host nation. Yeah, all the time, that's a constant work. What neutral states don't do enough to demonstrate we are useful as neutral states. 
So then it becomes credible. Then it is a good security guarantee. So no danger and being useful is a very good security guarantee. I don't know whether all the politicians really understand this. So of course, if an alliance doesn't want a neutral state being neutral, uh, uh, we know this from the Peloponnese War. If, if the Athens, Athens didn't want uh, Melos to stay neutral, they destroy it. So that's great power act like this. So uh, I, we cannot avoid, but it, uh, avoid this. But on the other hand, um, neutrality is a very useful and uh, peaceful and uh, uh, instrument, and it's a very good security guarantee as well. You know that I agree with you, and I thank you very no. much, <laughs> Dr. Gertner, for uh, for uh, your explanations. And I hope to talk to you very soon again. Thank you, Pascal, for the conversation. Thank you. Have a very good evening. Thank you.